God. How many believers do we have in the house tonight? Glory to God. Scripture tells us that Jesus, that the Lord God Almighty is enthroned on the praises of His people. So come on, church. Let's lift the throne to the Lord. Go ahead right now. Right where you're at. Let's shift your praise right there. Lift your holy hands. Lift your heart to the Lord. Give Him praise. Let your heart express itself through your lips. Glory to God. Jesus, we praise and magnify you. We declare your name in this place. Your name is like ointment poured forth. Your name, the name above every name whereby men might be saved. Your name, O Lord, in which we're kept. Your name that saved us. Your name, Lord. You're good. You're good and your mercy endures forever. Majesty, Lord. Majesty, we worship you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you in this place. You're awesome and good and powerful. Hallelujah. Come on, church. 15 seconds more. Let's worship him and praise him right there. Come on. 15 seconds more. Come on, church. 15 seconds more. Hallelujah. Glory be to God forevermore. Glory be to the Most High, Maker of heaven and earth. Glory to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Glory to the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Rose of Sharon, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, lover of our soul, righteousness, consciousness. Hallelujah, our sanctification, our Savior, our healer, our deliverer, the most high God, maker of heaven and earth, a sustainer of our life, healer of our body, restorer of our soul, renewer of our mind, the one and only Lord Jesus Christ, we give you praise in the house. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Blessing and glory and honor and praise to you, Lord Jesus. Have your way in this house tonight. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Man, what a great night to be together, church. God has something wonderful in store for you tonight. We have our guest minister with us tonight. I'm going to introduce him in just a moment. And then he's going to come up and minister by the Spirit, by the Word of God. And then I'll be back up to wrap up the details of the service. And then we have an after party. Actually, that's another name for an impromptu baptism that's going to happen after the service tonight. Hallelujah. Angels are going to be rejoicing. Hallelujah. We had a young lady this morning ask after the service if she could be baptized. So praise God. After we dismiss tonight, if you want to hang around for that, man... Everybody, I'll tell you, do I belong there? Man, if you can be here and, and be on her side and root for someone that's committing her life to Christ, hallelujah, and show them with baptism. If you can be here and, and glory to God and be for her, then please hang around. Hallelujah. And, and, and man, isn't that awesome? Can we celebrate with her even before we get there? Glory to God. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. We're so glad. Well, we're going to introduce our speaker in just a moment, but before we do, why don't you greet one another, share the love of Christ with each other, give somebody a high five, a handshake, hug their neck, hallelujah, welcome them to church, tell them to get ready, get ready, get ready. Glory be to God. By the way, I'm Lauren Hershey. I'm the lead pastor here at the church. I'm so glad that you're with us tonight, that we come together to worship God and to receive from Him and find out what time it is that we're living in. Glory to God. Can I, as we do this, can I see a show of hands? If you were not here this morning, if this is your first time to be with us today, could you raise your hand so I can look around and see several, several. So just wanted to find out who, who's here and... and uh, Find out where you were this morning so I can call you up and dock your, you know, charge you greater at the end of for the offering or something, you know, if you're not. No, seriously, we're so glad that we have with us tonight Reverend Joseph Morris from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Joe has been in the ministry for uh, and traveling full time for over 30 years. He and his wife, Colleen, 
have ministered around the world in Bible schools and, and conferences, believers meetings, church services, and training believers. The emphasis of their ministry in such a joyful way is to help each one of us discover who we are and take our place in Christ and enjoy the abundant life we have in the Lord and fulfill those accomplishments that God has called us to do, as well as a special emphasis on end time events and where we are right now. The Lord uses him mightily, and we're so glad that he's here with us tonight. So would you stand up and give the Lord uh, and Reverend Joe Morris a good welcome? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, sir. Bless you, bless you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, you can be seated. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, glad you came back tonight. Good to see you. It's just wonderful that we take the time to hear the word. There's something about hearing his word, the incorruptible seed. When it's sown, it grows up and it becomes. So there's, a, there's something about being there. In those meetings as a kid, my mother, uh, well, a pastor friend of mine in California said that I had a drug problem growing up. I did. My mother drugged me to church. And, uh, I mean, it was, it, she got kind of psycho into it in 1970 to about 75. We were in church every night. I, I just thought that was normal, you know, doing your homework on the floor. But if you, if you get around the word, it'll get in you. It can't get in you until you get around it. So, and, I, and I know that right now, man, you have YouTube. You can listen to old services. And you can get uh, Pastor Lauren's messages over and over again and, and overdose on the Word because it's good to know who you are in Christ, good to know your authority, good to know about the name of Jesus. Uh, amazing tonight, we know that I, I lo know you guys so well that I know that we all know that we've been quickened, we've been raised, we've been seated. I don't have to spend 30 minutes trying to let everybody know who they are in Christ. You already know who you are in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? You know, 100 years ago, you'd say that. People, what are you talking about? He, he's already presented you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Jesus did that. He purchased you. It's called redemption. So what a treat to come together to get into all the events of how close we are to his return. So why would the Lord want us to do that so we'd have a heads up? So that we'd pay attention and we would pick up the pace. As you see the finish line, we run faster. And we don't fit church into our life. It is our life. So, man, I love the, the building, the kick out, the extra room. And I believe you'll just fill this up even more again, 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 and, and have to do all kinds of other stuff. And, and it'll be fun to see what happens. Uh, this is our season. Uh, the, the importance of it is so amazing, but it's also such a joyful time because we're about to see him. I mean, you think about those songs we sing. What is it going to be like all of a sudden we're in his presence seeing him? Uh, wow, the Bible says we'll be a, a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Crystal is the only element that you can't hide a flaw. We'll be flawless before the throne of God. No more storms, <laughs> amen. Thank God we know we have authority. We can speak to the storm, but it will be nice <laughs> to have the calm water, hallelujah, and see the throne and see that, that basin. I think that's the first thing we'll see. I know we, we talk about the rainbow all the time at the throne of God, but we'll see a basin right there in front of it, and it's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners dip beneath that uh, flood lose all their guilty saints. So he purchased you, and he loves you. He wants you encouraged. He wants you lifted up. He wants you wild, bold, and wild, strong. Amen. So grab your Bibles, and you just turn wherever you think y'all turn. We'll see if you're flowing. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and we have a ton to get into. I'm, I'm compressing about, I don't know, you know, 20 hours into about three hours, so it's a lot. And you know, this is how important it is to the Lord. I was in Buffalo, West Virginia a few years ago. And I did Gifts of the Spirit all day Saturday, classes, and then Sunday morning, Sunday night on End Times. And Sunday morning I came in, the Lord said, hey, talk about Esther. I said, Lord, I can't talk about Esther, I'm doing End Times. Second time he said, talk about Esther. I said, hello, uh, you're God, you know that it doesn't work like that. I can't talk about Esther and do End Times, it takes too long. Third time he said, talk about Esther. I said, Lord, it takes me a minute to even get started, much less talk about Esther when I'm supposed to do End Times. Fourth time, he's so patient, bless his heart. He said, he said do it, talk about Esther. So I talked about how she risked her life and went before the king. And Mordecai told her, you know, salvation is going to come to the Jews, whether you obey God or not. You might as well recognize why you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And talked about it for maybe three minutes, just kind of a, a brief little injection of Esther's thought pattern. Well, the next day, our Congress had, voted, uh, had invited Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, to America. He went before the Congress. He said, I'm coming to you as Esther came before the king. Quoted verbatim, word for word, what I said there for a minute. Look how desperate the Lord is for us to connect the dots. Jesus is just about to come back to the planet. I mean, he loves you. And I know that freaks people out sometimes. You can kind of feel it like, well, how can we really be bold about that? Well, once we get through all the signs, it's not rocket science. It's just you're very close to him coming back. <laughs> and so he, he wants you blessed. Hallelujah. Excited. Expectant. 
And we'll kick over a couple of sacred cows tonight, but we'll get into truth. Truth sets you free. You know, it's amazing how people, on, I don't get mad at it, but on TV, they'll preach these things. They'll take verses out of the Gospels and try to put that on the church, which are good verses, but he's really talking to the Jews in a lot of places. And it puts a cloak on us that we don't bury, like, like the ten virgins. If you don't have oil in your lamp, you're not going to go up. He's not talking to the church there. He's talking to the world. I don't have to have oil in my lamp. I've got the maker of the oil in me. In this dispensation, as he is, so are we in this world. I'm him. Amen. I'll come down there on that one. I'll come right on down. Come on. <laughs> now, my friends call me the hangnail of the body of Christ, so it doesn't matter. At least you're in the body, praise the Lord. So don't be all freaked out about what parts you are. Just be glad you're in the body. Amen. So let's go to Luke 21. Let's pick up where we left off. We'll do about five minutes of review, then we'll kick right into what we're going to get into, and I'll sing something off my Great Sits album. Here we go. Luke 21, verse 24. They'll fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down or overthrown of the Gentiles or nations until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. We talked about it this morning, the Six-Day War. Jerusalem was won back. Wasn't that kind of the Lord to tie timing into physical events so that it would make it easy for us? So Jerusalem is one back. The miracles that happen, you can Google against all odds, miracle after miracle after miracle. We talked about the tanks this morning, the Egyptian army. There was one time where the Israelis were surrounded by the Syrians, and there was a minefield right there, and they looked at each other and said, well, we're, you know, there's nowhere for us to go. We're going to die. And all of a sudden, this huge wind blew through and uncovered, exposed every one of the mines. They walked right through the minefield. Miracle after miracle after miracle for Jerusalem to be won back. So that's so bold to tie it to that. That happened in 67, our lifetime, not 500 years ago, not 100 years ago, in 1967. So go down a little further, and he gets a little clearer. He says in verse 29, he said, look at the fig tree, that's the nation of Israel. All the trees, that's the prophetic nations around Israel. When they now shoot forth or bud, you see and know of your own selves that summer our harvest is not at hand. Likewise, when you see these things come to pass, freak out. No. He said, he said when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is not at hand. Notice his verbiage. He's not, he didn't say sense. He didn't say perceive. He said you could know this. Now, it freaks people out to get really bold about it, but I'm pretty bold in the spring when I see the trees turn. I know summer's coming. I don't freak out and go, oh, don't be so bold about that. Well, summer's coming. And Jesus compared the fig tree budding to summer coming the same Seed time and harvest has, has been here since the earth began. And it'll be here forever. The earth's going to be renovated. The world's never coming to an end. Jesus is going to stop war. Then he's going to renovate the earth and take a U-Haul and move heaven down to earth. I mean, how cool is that? I hate to move. That's a move right there. You move a, a planet down to this planet. That's what the Bible says he's going to do. So, so the earth's going to be here forever. So that's why Jesus compared these things to tangible, physical things that you can bank on. Okay, when the trees start budding, you know summer's coming. When the fig tree buds, Israel, you, you know the, he's coming. The kingdom's coming. And the next verse is a real kicker. Look how bold he is in verse 32. Verily I say unto you, this generation will not pass away till all is fulfilled. Wow. He said, heaven and earth will be altered, but my words will not be altered. And I like verse 34. He said, take heed to yourselves. I like the message Bible there. He said, let, don't, don't let the sharp edge of your expectation Get dulled by shopping and the cares of this life. We are so busy that you can be living right before he returns and not even know it. Amen. So it's amazing how he wants us to have a heads up. We said at first service this morning, uh, there are more verses written about right now than anything in the book. Why? So we would have a comprehension of we're about to see Jesus. So we make some changes in our lives. We, we live holy. We, we're kinder. We're more merciful. We cut people more slack. Am I in the right room? Wouldn't that be cool to, to be like that? I, I have the t-shirts out there. My daughter got me this little pen years ago. Jesus is coming. Look busy. I mean, kind of like you can fake it. Well, you can't fake it. He is coming. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But we want to be doing his will. What a cool thing to be said of us that we were in church on fire for God, fervent in spirit, white hot, serving the Lord. That's, that's the witness we want right before we're caught up. Hallelujah. I know a lot of friends of mine over the years, you know, they have yeah, the Lord's not coming back. Next thing you know, boom, we're caught up. It's going to be fun to be talking to each other on the way up. Yeah, here we are. Here we are right there. Hallelujah. It's going to be joyous. So we'll get into all that. But let's run through the signs for just a moment, and then we'll get right into the next event. We know we got Israel made a nation, number one. Jerusalem went back, number two. Those are the big ones. He said, if you see those two, you're the generation. But then you got Hebrew language restored. You got the Ethiopian Jews brought back. You got the fertility of the land of Israel. You got the revival of the Roman Empire. Did anybody Google the Capitol building? Anybody do that? That's good homework tonight. Google the Capitol building in Strasbourg, France. 
It's not similar to the Tower of Babel. It's identical to the Tower of Babel. I've been to the building in Brussels, and the, uh, the, the, the walls are covered with stuff from Nebuchadnezzar. They don't even know what it all means. It's that, that system that came from, from Baghdad, Iraq, where the, all the false religions came from. This is where the Tower of Babel was. And, man, they, they put all that, that information. I don't even think they know what it is, but it's, it's from the devil. <laughs> it's not good. So you see that system coming on the scene, and, and it's just like the U.N., all this pressure on Israel, trying to change history, trying to change dates, just like the Antichrist will do, like saying the, 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 the tomb of the patriarchs doesn't belong to the Jews. Really? Uh, God told Abraham, that's yours. <laughs> and uh, I like it that Herzog, years ago, went before the U.N. He said, well, I've got a document. How many of you, when you close on a house, they do a title deed, you know? He, he, he said, I have a title deed here. It's about 4,000 years old. He read from the book of Genesis. <laughs> you, can't really, you can't really argue with that, that God said 4,000 years ago, this section right here is yours. Well, of course, the attack against that is so satanic, Lucifer wants that spot where Jesus is going to reign, and it's been that way since creation. He wants that location, but he's not going to have it. Hallelujah. Jesus is going to reign from Jerusalem. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he's Lord. To the glory of God the Father. What an amazing event. The second coming of the Lord. I mean, we know the rapture seven or eight years before that. But the signs of the second coming are so clear. I mean, you have sign after sign after sign. We talked about this one of the predatory birds. 172 different species of predatory birds. We talked about ISIS trying to dam up the Euphrates River twice. Because the Bible says the Euphrates runs dry right before the second coming of the Lord. you got things indicative of, uh, remember the Jews were caught <laughs> buying all this land in Petra. And it kind of freaked me out when they announced that when I was there. And I was like, wow. They go, we don't understand this. The Jews keep buying up all this land because the Bible says they go over to Petra for safety during the tribulation. So you've got all these little bitty things that are happening that point to it. Russia going into Crimea. Russia going into Ukraine. Russia basically having armament all over the, the nation of Syria. So on the north of Israel, you've got Hezbollah that lat two weeks ago. Iran helped them change their, their uh, 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 aiming systems on their missiles because they want to annihilate Israel. Because the Bible says right after we're raptured, Russia, Iran, Turkey, and Syria come down on Israel to invade it. And the Bible says that God uh, turns 82% of Russia back. And see, notice during the Holocaust, God did intervene because he gave the church all authority. So he takes the church off the earth so he can kind of play rat-a-tat-tat with his baseball bat. You know what I'm saying? It's going to go back to Old Testament time. And, uh, I mean, it's just he's going to protect Israel. I mean, when, when Colleen and I were dated, she was living in California, my wife. And, uh, you know, I, I tried to date by text, you know, and it just doesn't work, man. You try to convey emotion. Uh, you know, your hair looks so cool. I love you, man, whatever. I moved her from California to Tulsa so we could court. God moved Israel from all over the earth back to that little piece of real estate so he could court her. And right after we're raptured, he's going to show off for her. Hallelujah. He's going to show them that Jesus is the Messiah. So what a, what, a, what a wild deal to be living when all this planning is coming together right in front of our eyes. I mean, event after event after event after event that points to the second coming of the Lord. So, I mean, the Lord wants us to know he had a tribe in the Old Testament called the tribe of Issachar. What? That had an understanding of the times to know what the children of Israel ought to do. Indicating if you don't know what time it is, you won't know what you're supposed to do. So Israel is our timepiece. Okay? Now, I would have said, because I'm a Holy Ghost Word guy, I would have said, well, when the church starts operating in the power of God and all that, God's so merciful, he took a group that was scattered and regathered them so it can transcend location. I mean, I had a woman one time in Topeka, Kansas, had no fingers, got her fingers back in a meeting. But you didn't know about that here in Dubuque. I had, you know what I'm saying? So God did something that transcended one miracle. He did the massive miracle of regathering them. So what a wonderful thing he did in our lifetime. He scattered them in Acts chapter 8, regathered them in your lifetime. So the miracle of all miracles he's already done. So we, we should rejoice that Jesus is just about to come. Hallelujah. Now there's many, many other things. You know the Temple Mount Institute? There's, oh my, there's sign after sign after sign. We talked about Aerosmith, Stephen Tyler getting saved today. That's probably the biggest sign. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We got into the blood red moons. We got into the Bethlehem star. We got into all those things. The heavens are signaling how close we are. So we're super, super privileged. So let's pick up with the next event, and we'll get into what we can look forward to because he wants us joyful and expectant. The whole purpose of right now is radical fuel for you to finish your course and run your race to where we're not just coming to church going, oh, that's a good message, I feel strong. No, we're doing something with the message right here before we leave. We're going to be glad we did because remember, the rapture is not an ending, it's a beginning. 
Okay, you're, uh, we used to kind of think we'd all be, the, the picture that most people have of after we're raptured is we're up in heaven playing harps. <laughs> if that was true, we'd be in harp class right now. No, we're not going to be playing harps. You're tasting of the powers of the world to come. So it's good to get to know the Holy Ghost because you're not done with him during that whole thousand years, and we'll get into that tomorrow night. So let's pick up with the next event. Go over to Thessalonians, and we'll, we'll pick up where we left off. And I, I know that was a long time for... Uh, um, what do we call that? Reviews? Or what do you call that? Something like that. I can't remember what it was. But go to 1 Thessalonians and watch this. Now, Paul, writing to the church at Thessalonica, is the first letter written to the churches. Guess what the theme was? The coming of the Lord. He was with them for two weeks. Guess what he talked about? Now, I would have thought he talked about who you are in Christ and, you know, you're quick and you're raised and seated. He talked about the Antichrist, talked about the rapture, and talked about the second coming because they were so freaked out. Nero was killing so many people, he tried to bring them some peace. So isn't that something? He said, remember, I told you these things before while I was with you. So people go, well, how come we need to know about the rapture? How come we need to go? Well, because Paul wrote that in his very first letter. If you're aware of those things, you make adjustments in your life. You know what I'm saying? You don't run blindly right into the very end of the, of the church age. You run boldly doing the will of God. And if, the number one thing that's tried to happen to the church is, is to back away from our boldness, a lack of caution in our faith. We're taught now, but don't be too bold. You might offend everybody. The early church was bold. Well, that one are real good. I think I'll do Elvis on that one. Here we go. I can't do it with my Bible, but that's what it is. The early church was known for their boldness, not their coldness. That went over real good. Good night, everybody. Drive safely. Praise the Lord. Start the car. I'll be right there. Here we go. All right, go to Thessalonians. Let's get into this. Let's have fun. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse 13. He said, but I would not have you to be ignorant. I'll give, give you a little time to get there. I don't think I gave you time. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, scare one another with these words. No, he said comfort one another. And actually in the Greek, the margin of your Bible there, it says exhort. It means to call nearer to the Lord. So right before the rapture, he wants us calling each other near. Exhorting means to talk to each other about it. Like, hey, Jesus is coming. It just gets you close to him. So here Paul wrote this. He said, number one, I wrote this so you'd be happy and hopeful. There's five things about the coming of the Lord. It's all good news. Don't be troubled. Don't be deceived. I want you happy. I want you hopeful. And I want you comforted. There is no bad news for us. It's weird how people won't almost thrive on things looking bad. For the world, it's very scary. But for you and I, there, it's called the blessed hope. Uh, Pastor Lauren and Pastor Joy and I were talking. You know, I had a, a famous evangelist said, Joe, if you preach on the coming of the Lord, you just get everybody's hopes up. Oh, duh, it's the blessed hope. <laughs> yeah, it's actually okay to be happy. You know, we got so used to going through storms that for people to get excited and happy, you almost felt guilty for being happy. Come on, were you happy the night before you got married? Come on, that's what we want to talk about. Uh, we're, we're about to meet him face to face. <laughs> if you weren't happy the night before you got married, you may have made a mistake. Come on, don't, don't freak out on me. But here, the rapture of the church, how crazy is this? I know this sounds bizarre, but we're going to be caught up. We're going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we've borne the image of the earthy. We're going to bear the image of the heavenly. This mortal is going to put on immortality, never to gain weight again. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank God for that new body. If you can't get excited about anything, get excited about that. Because, um, you know, I said this morning, my weight is perfect. I'm just not tall enough. If I was 6'3", everything would be perfect. But what, a, what an amazing event that it will be just like Enoch. Enoch was walking with God, and he disappeared. He was caught up. Elijah, raptured. Elisha, the, they even knew the day Elijah was going to go up. Sons of the prophets said, don't you know your master is going to be taken from you today? He goes, I know it. Shut up. Next thing you know, man, boom, he's caught up. So we saw Jesus raptured. We'll see the church raptured. You got raptured during the tribulation. So it's a, a doctrine to take people off the planet. People go, well, how can you tell the church is going to go up before the tribulation? Well, you got to look at Scripture. Uh, uh, the angel went into Sodom and Gomorrah and told Lot, I can't do anything here until I get the righteous out. 
Because Abraham said, now, would you judge the, the righteous with the unjust? And God's like, no, it won't do that. So he takes the, the church off the earth. Number one reason, you have so much authority, he has to take you off the earth. You would dictate what happens during that seven years. You'd be speaking to asteroids. You'd be speaking to that. The seals couldn't happen. The Antichrist couldn't come on the scene. You have so much power. Paul said it. The Antichrist can't even be revealed until you leave. You can't have the Christ here and the Antichrist here at the same time. The Bible calls you Christ. Now, that's Bible. <laughs> Amen. So how cool is it we depart? I mean, I know it sounds bizarre as I'll get out, but there's a couple of reasons why we have to leave. Number one, uh, you have an appointment. You've got to go to the reward seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there's many, many things in detail in all the things that point to the rapture of the church. It's, it's the unveiling of a king. There's always a private ceremony before the public one. The church gets to go to the private ceremony. That's what the Feast of Trumpets talks about. We go to this private ceremony, and then we come back with him at the second coming, and he's revealed to the whole earth as the king of kings and lord of lords. There's the public ceremony. Wow, the pomp and circumstance. You ain't never seen pomp and circumstance like you're going to see when he's presented to the earth as the king of kings and the lord of lords. Oh, come on. The author of life, the one that created everything you see, the one that thought of everything you've ever thought of or seen, he's the author right there. And he'll, he'll stand right there at the second coming. The Bible says it's so violent that there's an earthquake and the temple goes up a couple hundred feet and the waters from the Dead Sea come out and go right by Jesus. There's so much life in him, it goes out and quickens the whole earth. It just gets near him and it quickens the whole earth. He's not near you. He's in you. Come on. Amen. So our king, our savior, all of a sudden to be revealed. So this event called the rapture, number one, we, we need a new body. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. There's several reasons why we have to be caught up. Number, number, first of all, is a new body. <laughs> you know, uh, in the old covenant, you had cherubim and seraphim. Uh, you know, think about it. Isaiah saw them. He goes, man, I'm undone. He saw the throne. Well, he saw the cherubim. They had two wings that covered their face, two wings that covered their feet, and two wings that they fly with. Now, they're created to be at the throne, yet they still have to shield themselves from his glory. So God's going to give us a new body where we can walk right in and talk to dad so it doesn't fry our rods and our cones. You know, you want to go and talk to dad. I can't see for six months. How weird would that be? Good to see you, dad. Well, it ain't good to see nobody else. No, he's going he's gonna to give you a new body. And, you know, it's not weird or a, a, a ferial member. Well, let's look at the scripture for a moment, and we'll talk about this. Remember when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was on the road to Emmaus. And a couple of the disciples saw him, and they didn't know who he was. Their eyes were beholden to the, to the fact they didn't recognize him. That's kind of interesting how that works. The Lord was in the incognito. So they're walking along, and they were sad. Jesus said, why are you so sad? First thing he asked them, he said, well, if you haven't looked around here, they crucified our Lord. The Bible says that he would have kept right on walking. They constrained him to stay for dinner. He sat down with them. Notice this. Jesus is physically there with them, and he took them through the word. He could have said, nah, 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 nah. I told you I'd be raised from the dead. No, he took them through the scripture. He unveiled Christ in all the old covenant leading up to the New Testament. How cool is that? What a great resurrection message that'd be. Who'd you hear that from? Jesus. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty cool. So, you know, they, 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 he, they broke bread. He disappeared. They ran back and told the disciples, we saw him. He, he took us through the word. And, and they go, no, you didn't. Thomas goes, in fact, you guys are crazy. I don't believe he's raised from the dead. I won't even believe until I see the hole in his hand, the hole in his side. Boom, Jesus walks right through the wall. Thomas, be not faithless, but believing. Reach hither your hand, thrust it into my side. And they freaked out. <gasps> He's a spirit. No, he said, no, handle me. A spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see I have. So it gives you a clue about our body. He's got a glorified body that he walks through the wall. And what's the first thing he said? Do you have any meat? He didn't say, do you have any kale? He didn't say, do you have any salad? You didn't have any broccoli? The first thing he said was, do you have any meat? So in his glorified body, he asked for meat. That's the first thing he said. He didn't say, man, good to see you guys. Great to be with you. He goes, you got any meat? So in his glorified body, he had an appetite. You could handle him, and he wasn't freaky. I mean, it did freak them out that he walked through the wall. How cool is that? That's a picture of your glorified body. That's what you'll be doing. You know, often we think it's just going to be a weird time. You know, I was in a service in... Newtown, Connecticut, Pastor Barry and Sheila Fredericks. I don't know if you know the Fredericks. Great pastors from Long Island, New York. Uh, super sweet. And come Sunday through Wednesday, I was preaching there years ago. And I knew what I was doing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Came Wednesday. Man, I didn't know what to preach on, you know. So the Lord said, Pre play, <laughs> pin the suit on the pastor. And I would learned this from Pentecostals. You know, you, you have the pastor come down. You put a 50 on him, put a 100 on him, buy him a new suit. So that's all I knew to do. So we were doing that. And uh, 
all of a sudden, the youth pastor came up and said, hey, I have a check for your daughter, Joe. And I said, well, because my daughter does all this mission stuff. It's like $25. A guy jumped up and said, hey, I have a new Toyota Camry for the youth pastor. He gave 25 bucks, got a new car right there in the service. All of a sudden, people started giving all over the church. It was one of the coolest meetings I've ever been in in my life. So I wanted to get involved, so I, the Lord told me to give my Fender Stratocaster away. So I love the way the brother, I watched that brother play the guitar. So, so the Lord said, give your Fender to this kid back there. So I said, hey, buddy, right back there in the back. He's probably about 15 or 16. I said, I have a Fender Stratocaster for you. He went crazy. He had just told his mom, I want a Fender Strat. And she said, well, you better believe God for it. So the reaper overtook the sower in those meetings. So, you know, I went to the guitar center uh, the next week to get me a cheaper guitar to get me through until I could get a cool guitar. And the Lord said, why don't you play every instrument? You're going to live forever. Yeah, see, we don't think like that. We think right now. You're going to live forever. Play the piano. Play the violin. Play whatever you want. If you don't want to do it, don't worry about it. But see, we, we're so caught up in right now. And you're at the edge of the end of the church age to where we're going to step into eternity. Boy, it gets quiet when you think about that. <laughs> Woo, praise the Lord. All right, let's get back to the scripture. All right, so you're going to get this new cool body. Never to gain weight again. Never to get tired again. Wow, how cool is that? That's righteous. So uh, let's talk about it. What's the qualifications? Go back to your, to your Bible there. Let's talk about the qualifications. We've got to get rocking here. Look at the qualifications. Look at verse. Well, you pick out a verse. We'll see if you're flowing. Look at verse 14. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So the qualifications to be raptured or caught up are to be in Christ. So it's weird all the doctrines that are coming out now. You've got to be in faith. You've got to do this. No, no, no. If you're in the body, you're going up. We've made it about us. It's not about us. It's about him coming back for his body. I mean, just like if I was preaching tonight and I had one leg, I'd be looking forward to getting the rest of my body back. He's looking forward to getting reconnected to his body, and he purchased you. So it has nothing to do with what you've done. It has everything to do with what he has done. So the rapture is not about us. It's about him. Because we, we have all this weird teaching. Even now, I know minister after minister, well, the rapture is a new doctrine that came about in the 1800s. I'm like, well, you're a little off there. Enoch was raptured way before 1800. Elijah was raptured way before 1800. And it's a doctrine uh, uh, to, uh, to, to take the righteous off the earth. So we're going to get us this new body and go to the reward seat of Christ. So thank God we're, we're, we qualify. Okay? Hang with me for just a second. I remember I was preaching in Galveston. A lady came up to me. She goes, how dare you say if you're in the body of Christ, you're going up? I go, well, I'm trying to be scriptural because I'm a word guy. Because if I don't have scripture for it, I remember preaching in the Bible schools in Germany. We'd have question and answer, and they said, well, you said so-and-so. So, oh, no, I did not say so-and-so. The Bible says so-and-so. Because the Germans just hammer you over scripture and verse. So this lady says this to me, and the Holy Ghost is so cool. He, he loves to magnify Jesus. He said, ask her, whose works would she rather trust in? Her works or my works? Oh, come on, by himself he purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as by him he attained a more excellent name than they. Come on, he did this, so that's why he owns you. So at the rapture of the church, he's going to say, come up hither, come up to the throne of God. And my friend, all the loved ones that have gone home to be with the Lord, all, he's so powerful, he'll say, come up hither, and their bodies are going to be recreated. Doesn't matter how long ago when they went home, he'll take a molecule of their body and give them a brand new body. Woo, hallelujah. And we'll go up to meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. So uh, the wonderful thing about this is, People have always thought that we can't know when the rapture is going to be. So hang with me a minute. Just cut me a little slack for a minute. We've been taught incorrectly. Because if you keep reading the Thessalonians, he said, you are not in darkness that that day would overtake you as a thief. Now, I'm not going to tell you the exact day the rapture is going to happen, but I'm going to tell you the thought pattern of the Lord concerning the rapture, okay? Okay, now, the only little reference in the Gospels is kind of cool, John 14. Remember, in my Father's house there are many mansions, but not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where you are, where I am, there you may be also. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Now, as bizarre as that is, that was a Jewish wedding proposal. And he tells that to his staff. See, dudes don't ask dudes to marry him. So I could just see them. Go, Did he just ask us to marry him? This is weird. You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, how weird is that? That he's talking to his guys there. And he basically said, will you marry me? And I'm sure they went to each other. I knew it. Been out in the sun too long. Something's up. He's lost his mind. So the only little hidden reference to the rapture is right there. Now, hang with me. In the Jewish culture, gosh, we have not been taught this correctly. I've been to Israel many times, and I interview lady after lady after lady. In the Jewish culture, a man would ask a woman to marry him. They'd be betrothed. 
he would go to his father's house and his father would oversee the building of a honeymoon suite for them. And the father would tell him when the room is ready. Well, the bride, she wouldn't get all ready until it got time for him to come back to get her. Now, how, how would she know how long it was before he come? Word would come to her that the house is almost done. <laughs> she goes, well, we wouldn't want to put on all the spices and all the perfume for six months. She said, we almost knew to the day, within a day. We didn't know the exact hour, but we almost knew within a day. I said, really? She goes, well, of course. We're not going to spend all that money on all the perfume and then him be two more weeks. I said, you're serious, so you'd know almost to the day? She goes, sure, word would come to us. Word's coming to you today from Tulsa, Oklahoma, that the house is almost built. The fullness of the Gentiles is about in, and he's going to come back for his church. So we're, we're, we have the word coming to us. Why? So you can be excited. <laughs> it's not supposed to take you by surprise. Read it. For the world, they shall say peace and safety. Then sudden destruction comes upon them, not on you. You are not in darkness that David would overtake you as a thief. Let's kick over another sacred cow for, for a second. <laughs> Gosh, you don't have, I don't have time to preach on all this, but hang with me. Everybody with me? Everybody say caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, when Jesus said of that day and that hour, no man knows, he was telling them, I'm coming back for you on Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets, he was basically going, I'm coming back for you on that day. What do you mean? Feast of Trumpets was on the 29.5th day of the month. That's why they didn't know if it was on the 29th or the 30th. The Sanhedrin would send two witnesses out and go, that's the day right there. Didn't know if it was the 29th or 30th. So when he said that, they go, wow, he's coming back for us on the Feast of Trumpets. There's about seven things about the Feast of Trumpets that show us when he's coming back. Now don't get mad at me. He fulfilled every feast perfectly. First feast, he went to the cross on what? Passover. The feasts are festivals. They're dress rehearsals. So when Jesus got on the cross, he said, man, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What was the next feast? The Feast of Unleavened Bread. He was buried on the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Usually people are on the cross longer, but he had a feast to keep. <laughs> he had an appointment. Remember, he's, he said, I am. Oh, come on. I am the bread of life. Uh, Bethlehem means home of the bread. He's buried on unleavened bread. What was the next feast? Uh, first fruits. What happened on first fruits? He was raised from the dead. First born from the dead. Woo! Fifty days later, what happened? The Holy Ghost was poured out. Pentecost. What's the next feast? Feast of trumpets. You, you say, well, are you saying the, the Lord's going to come back on feast of trumpets? I'm not saying he is, but I, every September I'm going like this. Lord, I love you. I know, I know the exact time it's feast of trumpets in Israel. I know the exact time it is here in America. I mean, every September I'm going around, Lord, you're the, you're the deal. Hallelujah. I love you. So if I'm wrong, you can correct me on the way up. Because Enoch was raptured on, this is kind of radical, Enoch was raptured on, on Pentecost, born on Pentecost, raptured on Pentecost. The law was given on Pentecost. The Holy Ghost was given on Pentecost. So there's another little thing. But I think we'll know. We won't be freaked out. Just like at, on your wedding, just like a Jewish lady goes, word came to us, he's almost there. So it's almost time to go. We all have been taught incorrectly about that. Well, you mean we know when the Lord's coming back? Yes. And that freaks people out. Why? You change your life. You change your life. You, 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 li you live holy. You live excited. He wants you freaked out that you're about to see him. Boy, it gets quiet when you say all that, doesn't it? <laughs> Amen. The Lord's so good, isn't he? So how, what an event to all of a sudden, bizarre as it may sound, to never have to die. How crazy is that? To be caught up, to be raptured. It was, there were other people that didn't have to die. He didn't have to die. Elijah didn't have to die. Wow. All of a sudden, the church is going to be caught up. What an experience, the reward seat of Christ. You know what's coming for your life. You, you won't be judged for your sin, but you will be judged for your motives of your heart, whether they're gold, silver, and precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble. You don't want a bonfire at the reward seat of Christ. You don't want people to go, did you see that fire? <laughs> Woof, what was that? You don't want a lot of wood, hay, and stubble. You want gold, silver, and precious stones. And then you'll clothe yourself indicative to your faithfulness. You'll wear your faithfulness in the millennium. Your robes will be just like in the military. A general doesn't have to tell you he was faithful. His stars preach for him. He, I've never seen a general walk on a plane going, I'm a general, I'm a general, check it out, check it out, I'm a general. No, his uniform preaches for him. Yes. So what you've done for the Lord during this dispensation, you'll adorn yourself in gold and silver and precious stones, and your robes will indicate how faithful you were. You want to make sure you don't have a Speedo bathing suit during the millennial reign of Christ. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you want to have some robes on. Amen. You'll be able to look at people. Aha. Didn't do anything. during the. My dad got saved on his deathbed. I mean, he served the devil wholeheartedly all his life. He has a stroke. Gets saved on his deathbed. I'm going to be throwing clothes at him the whole millennium. Dad, put something on, buddy. Come on. Because you think about that. How blessed are we to let our life preach for us during that thousand years? 
The Bible says the day will declare it. So what you've done for him in this dispensation is going to preach for you at the reward seat of Christ. It's a mistranslation we call it the judgment seat. It's not the judgment seat. It's called the bema, the reward seat. Have you ever seen somebody in the Olympics get freaked out about getting their medal? No. All that training, you get blessed for your training. Let's go back to the scripture. I want to show you one thing, man. I'm, I'm preaching too long, but go to one thing so we can see how the, the rapture is pre-tribulation. So you don't have to be here during that time. Go to Daniel 9 for just a moment. And this is so cool because it's some of the coolest verses in the Bible. We won't go there long, but hang out with me for just a few more minutes. And then I'll get to my greatest hits album. Here we go. <laughs> There's real fear when you get into that right there. So go to Daniel 9, and I know this is a lot of info for just a minute, but it's so cool, it shows you you can't be here during the tribulation. Look at Daniel 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, which was the son of whatever that is, which was seed of the Medes, man, there's no way to pronounce it, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in desolation of Jerusalem. So he goes, hey, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting. So they were in captivity. Hang with me for just a minute. They were in captivity for 70 years, and Daniel was smart enough to go, hey, let's find out why we're in jail. You know, like, why, let's find out what we did wrong. So God told them, let the land rest every seven years. You're going to be blessed so far in the sixth, it'll take you all into the seventh, so don't plant any in the seventh. So guess how long they fudged? They started planting on that seventh year. Guess how long they did that? 490 years. So they owed the land back 70 years. Man, I'm glad we live in this dispensation. Come on. Under the law, he's like, hey, no problem. Go ahead and disobey. So his mercy went for 490 years. Remember, Peter asked Jesus, how many times do I forgive somebody? 70 times 7. 490 times. So with that, watch how Gabriel gives Daniel something that's probably the coolest verses in the Bible. Go to Daniel 9 there. Skip over to verse 23. And watch Gabriel explain something to him. Man, it's super detailed. Look at Daniel 9. Look over at verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplication, this is Gabriel talking to Daniel. At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth. I'm come to show you your greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. So in other words, you guys missed it for 490 years. Seventy weeks is just another way of saying 490 years. Seventy segments of seven. You missed it for 490. God, so merciful, has given you another 490. Okay? Now watch what he says. Who's it for? It's for the, upon the holy city. It's upon thy people, the Jews, and upon the holy city. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, bringing everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. And the oil of anointing they found just a few years ago in the dead, where the Dead Sea Scrolls are. They hadn't found them for a couple thousand years. They just happened to turn up perfect ingredients from the book of Leviticus because with the oil of anointing, they will anoint him at the second coming. So, so watch what he says here. This, this is the coolest verses in the Bible. Look at verse 25. Know therefore and understand... That from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince is going to be a certain amount of years or weeks, and I'm going to add them up for you. So he said something there that was simple, but it's complicated. He said, when you hear a commandment to rebuild Jerusalem until Jesus comes, it's going to be a certain amount of years. Remember King Artaxerxes was there, and Nehemiah was bummed out, kind of depressed. King Artaxerxes goes, what's the deal? He goes, well, Jerusalem's overthrown. He goes, don't worry. I'm going to make a commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, Gabriel goes, when that commandment comes forward, the clock's going to start. So all of a sudden, King Artaxerxes, doo -doo -doo -doo, doo -doo 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 -doo, the clock starts. So the commandment came forth. Jesus never really said he was the Messiah. Remember, they'd ask him, are you the Messiah? He said, go tell them what you see and what you hear. There came a day, though, he came riding into Jerusalem on that colt. Wow. And they put the palm branches down. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They said, oh, man, don't let them say that. You're admitting you're the Messiah. He said, if they didn't do it, the rocks would cry out. Because it was exactly 483 years from when that commandment came forth. But God gave them 490. He came after 483. He owes them seven years of old covenant time. It's called the tribulation period. It takes the church off the earth. Pays them back those seven years. It's not for you. It's for them. He promised them 490. He came after 483. So there's a seven-year gap that has to be fulfilled. And that's called the time of Jacob's trouble. He takes the church off the earth. And, man, it's fireworks. It's signs. It's wonders. It's just like with Moses. 
uh, Moses and Pharaoh was because of Pharaoh's heart was hardened. God's so merciful, he's going to put pressure on people. Because uh, some people won't make a decision until they have to. you got tomahawk missiles flying at you. You're probably going, I love you. <laughs> I mean, if you have any brains whatsoever in the midst of all that, isn't it amazing during that tribulation period, it kind of exposes where you are. You'll either be for him or against him. There won't be any kind of middle road there. You'll either be, you'll drive out those middle ones. So amazing after all those signs that you only have really 50% that repent. The Bible says it in Matthew 24, one's taken and one's left. That's at the second coming. 50%. But God's so merciful, he makes the earth have a show. <laughs> you've got blood red moons. You've got water turning to blood. People are out fishing, not catching much. Well, duh, the water turned to blood. You're not going to be able to avoid that. We're not catching much these days. Well, hello, the water turned to blood. So it's not going to be like people go, I had no idea. They'll have to purposely go, I don't believe. So the earth's getting ready for the massive amount of pressure to come on it to get people to make a decision. He takes the church off the earth because you've got so much authority. Because it's not for you. You've got to go to the reward seat of Christ, marriage, supper of the Lamb. Man, what a party that's going to be. Man, how cool is that going to be? All the, the loved ones and all the saints there gathered around the throne having a party. And all of a sudden we get to come back on white horses with him. Giddy up. How cool is that? I guess we go to horse flying school for a couple hours. I don't know. <laughs> I've ridden motorcycles and I've ridden horses, but I've never flown on a horse. So I don't know, I don't know what the protocol is there with rudders or lift or whatever. But somehow... Uh, we'll be on those horses, and, and all of a sudden the earth, it'll be a day that's neither known to man, neither night nor day. The stars of the heaven will fall, and all of a sudden there'll be this radiant light. The Bible said there's no need for the sun because of the glory that's in his face. He'll lead the charge, and we'll be right there behind him on white horses. And what a view, what a ticket to ride right there. Come on, the earth will get closer and closer, and we'll watch the inhabitants of the earth bow in adoration. We'll watch, we'll watch uh, the planet Prepare for the entrance of God himself. <laughs> There's a hundred billion galaxies with a hundred billion stars like our sun, and he calls them all by name. And he's going to go from heaven to earth with us right there behind him. Whew, giddy up. Wow. How cool is that going to be? So isn't that amazing that someone prayed for all of us or we wouldn't be in church on Sunday night? Thank God somewhere someone prayed for all of us so that we would be hungry enough to come and hear the word. So these are great days of change. The biggest change ever for our lives is that we're going to be caught up, we'll be raptured. Hallelujah. You know, uh, you, know some, you talk to people, some people down there, bored about it, whatever, but I'm not going to be bored about it. I'm going to be excited about it. I'm, I'm about to see him. Amen. What would you do tonight if you were going to see him to, in the middle of the night, be caught up in the night? Yeah. Oh, man, we go to bed, Lord, we love you, we honor you, we magnify you. I believe your prayer life would get strong. Your praise life would get strong. This is the time to pray in tongues more than ever before. It's just a wonderful season. So how wild that we're here <laughs> when all these big changes are coming. So you're a very specialized group. So we'll get into tomorrow night how to, to bridge the gap going from the church age into the millennial reign of Christ. And God has raised all you guys up for that. How cool is that to have a wonderful destiny? Amen, amen. Let's pray. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your compassion. We're so grateful that we're in church on Sunday night. Thank you, thank you, thank you for someone praying for us. We embrace these changes, Lord, our glorified body. We embrace these changes to be with you in heavenly places physically. So, Lord, we, we surrender our hearts every service to do your bidding, Lord. We rekindle the different things that you've given us to do from heaven. Help us have a heavenly mindset before we're caught up to do your will. We thank you for it. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. You know, I had a couple words of knowledge come to me, and I'll just call them out real quick because, once again, I've preached too long. But, I mean, I've had the craziest words of knowledge over the years. Just, uh, I, we were talking today about a woman that didn't have a fingernail on her ring finger. finger. She's from Laconia. She's a pastor's wife now. I had a word of knowledge. Somebody had damage in their nails. It was in Boston 25 years ago. And she was afraid to come down. And... Uh, and so I called it out, and about 12 people came down. I said, none of you are the ones I'm looking for. You know how word of knowledge works? You kind of know if it's the right one. I said, none of you are the ones I'm looking for, but, but the Lord still wants to heal these people by faith. That's cool. She came up to me last year in Boston. She goes, you know, I was afraid to go down. <laughs> and uh, uh, she said, this was new to me. I said, I understand. She said, Lord, I'm sorry I didn't go down, but I'll take that fingernail. She said, right then, her fingernail grew in. That night, her boyfriend asked her to marry her. And so uh, I preached in her church uh, just maybe a month ago in Laconia. I preached there last year. Have her go up and tell the testimony. 
So, so words of knowledge are he just likes delivering miracles. One of the things that happened to me was someone has damage in the nerves in your ears. And I talked about that little girl got her hearing the other night. This is not deafness. This is just damage in your nerves. I mean, it'd be like ringing or something uh, uh, may have happened to you. Uh, uh, just receive it tonight on Sunday night. Get your, your nerves restored. This other thing is your jaw. You clench your teeth at night. It's almost like you're, something's up with the nervous system in your jaw. And 8.03 on Sunday night, uh, receive it. Receive that healing for your muscles in your jaw. Amen. Praise the Lord. Another thing that's kind of common is your tailbone. You, someone, you busted the, uh, uh, the lower part of your back. Not your lower back, but your tailbone. Woo! Amen. You're healed. Right, you, you got it. Good, good, good. <laughs> there you go. Take it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen, amen. He's so good, his mercy endures forever. Mercy endures forever. Isn't it crazy how merciful he is? I was in uh, Australia. Uh, uh, those worship leaders uh, said, bring our daughter to church today because daughter didn't want to come. She's like 15. And they, he said, you, whatever you do, you drag her to service. I'm preaching in Sydney. And I'm preaching along. She's sitting about right there, and she's mad the whole service. You, you, you can tell people don't want to be there. You can tell. She's sitting there just like yeah, mad the whole. And I'm trying to, I'm preaching on end times. I'm trying to tell her, Jesus is getting ready to see her. And she's ticked off. <laughs> I had a word of knowledge at the end that someone had damage on the base of their spine. And uh, I called it out. said, you don't even have to come down. You're healed. This girl comes up to me afterwards. She was number six in pole vaulting in the nation of Australia. Didn't want to come to church that day. Yelled at her mom and dad. And she's sitting there bawling after the service. Got her tailbone healed. God's so good. Even don't not even want to be there. <laughs> Mad because you're there. And get restored. Amen. He's, he's so good. His mercy endures forever. Amen. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his mercy. This other thing is a, a bladder deal. Your bladder is being restored. I don't know if it's the muscles in your bladder. don't know what it is. Uh, it's called a word. No, it's not a paragraph, so just receive it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, hey, you know how crazy this is? Uh, in California, I had a word of knowledge. I said, there's someone here. You got damage in your calf. It looks like varicose veins, but it's not varicose veins. It's like someone hit you with a tube before, and this man yelled out, damn. He cussed right there in church real loud. He goes, that's me. And I'm like, Wow. <laughs> He had gotten hit by two before at Home Depot and was going in for surgery on his vein. Got, got instantly healed right there in the service. I go back to that church every year, Marietta, California. He, I, I go, how you doing, buddy? Because I'm healed. <laughs> amen. He just loves us. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Somebody's electrical system's being healed in your body. I don't know what that's all about. I would think your nerves, but I don't know what it is. I'm not going to figure it out. He's healing you. Let's just thank him before we go. Lord, we thank you for taking care of someone's electrical system. We bless you. Someone's nose is being healed. You've got nosebleeds. You're being healed. Lord, I thank you for taking care of the inside of their nose. Thank you for wholeness, Lord. We lift you up before we dismiss, Lord. We lift you up, magnify you. Thank you for these changes that are coming so soon. Changes coming so soon. Help us fulfill our destiny before we're caught up. We thank you for it. We give you glory. We give you honor and give you praise. We lift up your wonderful name, Jesus. We lift up your name, Jesus. We lift up your name, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. We're so grateful and so thankful that you gave your life. We finish our service tonight with a spirit of thankfulness. Thank you, thank you, thank you for dying for us. We give you glory, honor, and praise. Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you for being so easy to preach to. You guys are so hungry. Tomorrow night we'll get into the millennium. You don't hear a lot of preaching on it, but it's probably the coolest thing to get into because it shows us our future. So come back if you can, and we'll, we'll have a great time. Have a great night. Look forward to seeing you getting baptized. God bless you. Amen. Give Pastor Lauren a big hand as he comes. Bless you, Pastor Lauren. Brother, praise the Lord. Hello, and thank you for joining us this week. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, I'd like you to prayerfully consider partnering with us financially so we can get the Word of God to more and more people. We really do pray that this ministry has been a blessing to you. And if you're in this area, next Sunday at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, come on out and join us. If you're not in the area, then please join us again online next Sunday. Thank you again and God bless you.